Now, our next speaker is one of the world's leading philosophers. At one time as well, he was also labelled the most dangerous man on the planet. Quite a title. He has, though, since moved up in the world to be named one of Time magazine's 100 most influential people. He is here to talk about the life that you can save. He really needs no further introduction. Please welcome Professor Peter Siner. Thank you very much, Jessica. And I want to thank the organizers of the conference, uh, Beth Phelan in particular, for the opportunity to be here and to speak to you in this beautiful venue. And also for the opportunity to hear at least some of Rinpoche uh, just before. I did have to get called out early to get this microphone put on. But I was very interested in what he had to say. And I think some of it links with what I want to talk to you about, but perhaps with a slightly different emphasis. Because he talked about the importance of, in the Buddhist tradition, of not committing any unwholesome act. He did also talk about kindness as being the essence of that tradition and about having positive emotions and thoughts and acting positively. But he then placed more emphasis, I would say, on avoiding causing harm. He said, well, at least don't harm. And of course, one can understand, at least don't harm. But what I want to say is that for people as fortunate as us, that's not enough. That's not enough to live an ethical life. And it's not enough, I believe, really to achieve happiness for yourselves. When I say people like us, I'm aware that I'm addressing a, an audience of very fortunate people among the perhaps most fortunate less than 1% of the world's population, perhaps less even than 0.1% of, of the world's population. We're speaking now in a, a wonderful hall, in a great town hall. If you're from Sydney, you're living in one of the great cities in the world. If you've come up from Melbourne, where I'm from, you're also living in one of the great cities in the world. Plus, it doesn't rain all summer. And if you're from Australia generally, I had to get that in because all during my childhood I was ribbed by Sydney friends about how much it rains in Melbourne. Climate change has turned the tables now. Um, but if you're, if, if you're from Australia in general, you're in one of the most fortunate countries in the world with a high living standard, with a great amount of personal security, political security. We can have debates about leadership, but uh, that doesn't mean that Kevin Rudd disappears into some camp out in the middle of the, the desert and is never heard of again. We, we are able to deal with those issues in a reasonable way that shows at least some amount of respect for basic human rights. So we're, we're very fortunate in that respect, and yet people still worry about their own happiness, their own well-being, there's still problems, a lot of people feeling about that, and I think you know, that's, that's no doubt why many of you are here. I think that's because we need to have purposes to be happy. We need to have goals that we feel are worthwhile and to be engaged in working towards them. And if we are able to earn enough to feed ourselves and our family in just a few hours' work each week, and if you're just thinking about the basics, that's what middle-class Australians can do. They earn enough in half a day or less to provide food for themselves and their family and maybe a bit more to provide shelter, but you satisfy your, your basic needs very easily, and then there's a sense of, well, what else do I do? What else is my life about? and we try and fill that in in a variety of ways. My argument, insofar as it relates to personal happiness, is that setting yourself ethical goals and standards that you can endorse and work towards and feel satisfied as you make progress towards them is 
an important source of happiness. The goal that I want to particularly talk about today is the goal of helping others, and particularly helping those in great need. And I'll start that by telling a little story that I've told often before and some of you may already be familiar with, either through reading some of my writings or perhaps having heard me talk on another occasion. So forgive me if you have heard it before, but perhaps not everybody has. I ask you to imagine that you're walking across a park, maybe you're walking around the beautiful botanical gardens you have here down near the harbour, and there's a shallow ornamental pond, it has a few ducks in it and a few water lilies, but you know it's not, it's not really deep, certainly not uh, for you, for an adult, it's maybe waist deep. And as you walk past it, you see that there's something in it and it's not just a duck. You look more closely and you see that it's a small child. A toddler has fallen into the pond and is flailing around, apparently in imminent danger of drowning. What do you do? The first thing you would do, I imagine, is you would look around and you would say, who's looking after this child? Where are the parents or, or the babysitter? Can't be a toddler on her own here in the park. But you don't see anyone. There's nobody in sight except you and the toddler. So the next thought you have is, well, I better jump into that pond and pull that child out. And then perhaps a less noble, less wholesome, as Rinpoche might have put it, thought occurs to you. Oh, unfortunately I put on my favorite pair of shoes and my favorite pair of trousers or dress, whatever you're wearing, are quite expensive. I'm really attached to them. They are not made for wading in muddy water and they're probably going to get ruined. So it's going to cost me maybe a few hundred dollars if I save this child. Now imagine you did have that thought, and imagine that you then said, well, it's not my child, and I didn't push the child in, I haven't harmed the child, have I? Just happened to be walking past. So I'll just go on my way, forget about the child. Maybe somebody else will come by and save the child, who knows? Don't see anybody who could, but maybe they will. Maybe the child won't die. But anyway, it's not my business, I'll go on my way. Would that be an acceptable thing to do? I hear somebody say no, and I'm pleased that that's your reaction. <laughs> I hope that's everybody's reaction. Somebody say yes, if you like, if you think it's not your reaction. Well, anyway, generally when I've discussed this with my students, that is the reaction. They say no, that would not be acceptable. It's not only that it would be very nice or very kind or very charitable of you to save the child, it would really be wrong not to save the child, just to walk on your way, because you don't want to have to spend those few hundred dollars in replacing your shoes and your dress or trousers or whatever, whatever they were. And of course, I, I agree with that. But that shows that we think that we do have a positive obligation to help people in great need especially where it's something like saving the life of someone whom we know is, is innocent, and I chose a child just because we know that children are innocent, it's not the child's fault that she's just fallen into the pond. But of course, adults too generally are you know, innocent, don't, don't deserve to die uh, through causes like that. And where the cost to us is not an excessive burden, not an excessive sacrifice. There is some cost but it's one that we can cope with. Our lives are not going to be irrevocably damaged because of, of what we do in saving the child. So if that's right, if in those circumstances we have an obligation to help to save a child's life or to save an adult's life, then let's think about the situation that we're in not in this imaginary circumstance, which could happen but would be very rare, but every day in the world in which we're living. We know that there are more than a billion people living in extreme poverty in the world today. Extreme poverty is defined by the World Bank as 
roughly speaking, in a sort of Australian 2012 dollars, maybe living on less than two dollars per day. And that's not what you could get for two Australian dollars if you went to one of these countries and changed it at the bank, where often the exchange rate is very favourable and you think, gee, you could live really cheaply in this country. That's the purchasing power equivalent of two dollars Australian. It's what buys as much in the local currency as two dollars will buy here in Sydney. Well, okay, maybe not in Sydney, maybe in Brisbane or Adelaide, I don't know, but some, something like that. So it's very, very little. And of course, the consequence of that is that many people go to bed hungry, that some children die simply from malnutrition, but more commonly, they die from other poverty-related causes, like diarrhea, because they don't have safe drinking water. And when they do get diarrhea, not a fatal illness when it occurs in Australia, when they do get it, they can't get any medical treatment, they can get dehydrated, and although there's very simple, very inexpensive treatment that could save their lives, they can't get it. It's not available in their village, they don't have transport to get where, where it might be available. Or they may die from malaria because they don't have a, a mosquito net. And if they do get malaria, they can't get the drugs necessary for it. Or they haven't been immunized against measles and they die of, of measles. Um, and a, a large number of causes like that. And even if they don't die, and uh, UNICEF estimates that I think it's something like uh, about 8 million children die every year from poverty-related causes, which is fortunately down from what the figure I gave in when I wrote The, Light, the Life You Can Save, which was published in 2009, when it was uh, closer to 10 million. So we're making steady progress even in those few years. But still, over 8 million children dying a year is over 20,000 dying every day. You can imagine a football stadium filled with 20,000 children that number of children dying every day from avoidable poverty-related causes. And obviously, if that really were to happen, 20,000 children in a football stadium dying, that would be a huge media story. It would be all over the television and the news. And a lot of people would say, I must do something about this. I'll donate. I'll contribute. But because it's happening all the time, it's in the background, it happens widely distributed in different villages and cities all over the world, we don't really hear about it. And people don't donate to anything like the extent that they would, I believe, if it were happening in one place. So that's the situation, that's what's happening, and there are things that we can do about it. There are a number of agencies which are working effectively to reduce global poverty. I've mentioned UNICEF already, which is one of them. I mention them because they keep good statistics. They're certainly one that is working to do this. Um, I've been a supporter for the past 40 years now of Oxfam in its various different national manifestations. Uh, Oxfam Australia, Oxfam Great Britain when I was uh, over there, currently Oxfam America when I'm in uh, the US. Um, but I believe they're one of the highly effective organizations. I'm grateful to the organizers of this conference who have um, made it possible for Oxfam to have some information in your bag about some of the work that they do. But there are a number of other worthy organizations as well. It's true, of course, that each of them needs to pay its staff something just to collect money, to develop good programs, to think what will be an effective way of reducing global poverty and saving the lives of, of children and adults. You need to have some administrative expenses. It's a fallacy to think um, I'll necessarily give to the organization that has the lowest administrative costs because they might be cutting costs so far that they can no longer be properly evaluating which of their programs are working. It's much better to say which are the organizations that are really making sure that the, let's say it's 80 cents in every dollar you give that after the administrative expenses go to the programs is really doing what we want it to do. 
So there are those effective organisations that are able to do um, significantly contribute to reducing this problem. And because, as I said at the beginning, because we are living in one of the wealthiest countries in the world, because we have government provided health care, education for our children, social security, pensions when we get old, we can be reasonably confident that our, our basic needs will be met. And even after making some provision for the future and having super schemes and so on, we have money to spend on things that we do not really need. And we do that all the time. Um, we spend money on things that go way beyond our basic needs or providing for the future. They are things that are luxuries or frivolities. Um, for example, we spend money on things to drink. I just looked around to see if there was a bottle of water here, and I'm pleased to see that the organizers have provided what I hope is Sydney tap water, which is perfectly drinkable stuff. Yet everywhere you go around, you see people selling bottled water for roughly the $2 a day that, as I say, more than a billion people in the world have to live on and feed their families for a whole day. And we buy that without thinking about it. Or we buy a coffee, or we buy a juice, or we buy a beer, or a bottle of wine, or we go out to the, to the theater, or to a concert, or we go on vacations. I'm not saying that this is all wrong. Certainly, I do some of these things myself. But I am saying it shows that we have the flexibility to take some of that and to use it to help some of the world's poorest people, to bring happiness to others, or at least to reduce the misery that afflicts others. And if we're talking about happiness, of course, I think the surest way to increase happiness globally is to focus first on reducing the greatest misery, the greatest suffering. Because that's something where I think we have reasonably clear ideas about what will help. And it's much harder to generally produce positive happiness for others, easier to make mistakes there, rather than focusing on the needs that, that others have and trying to relieve them. So I think that that is an obvious ethical goal that anyone living a middle class or above life in Australia can set themselves. To do something positive for those who are, through no fault of their own, just less fortunate. They were just born in circumstances where it's very difficult to get off the bottom. Um, I think we should recognize that most of us are lucky to have been born or to have been able to come to a country as fortunate as this one, and if we have wealth, then we're lucky to have had the circumstances in which we could make it. Warren Buffett, one of the world's richest people, once said that he didn't feel that he deserved his wealth. He was opposing the move under the Bush presidency to abolish death duties, to abolish the state tax, uh, state taxes. And he said he didn't deserve to be where he was. If he had been born in a village in Peru, his skill at picking stocks would have been totally useless. He would probably have been just as poor as his neighbors. So we're fortunate in that. I think what we need to do is to set ourselves some standards to think about giving to organizations that are effectively helping the global poor. In the book, The Life You Can Save, and also in a website I've set up with the same title, thelifeyoucansave.com, I've suggested a standard of giving that people can meet. Um, I'm not saying that you have to give away everything you spend on luxuries. I think that's unrealistic. I don't think generally people work that way, and I don't think that would be a productive thing to say. Instead, I've set up um, a progressive table, a little bit like your tax tables. You know, the more you earn, the more you pay. Um, similarly graduated. So that for most people, um, you can feed in the amount you earn, you feed in the, it's international, so you feed in Australian dollars if you're earning in Australian dollars. It adjusts for the currency, for the purchasing power in your country, and it gives you an answer 
to what it suggests you ought to be giving. And for most Australians, you'll be pleased to hear, I guess, it's suggesting you ought to aim at to give around 5% of what you earn, which is a lot more than most Australians do give to charity at all, let alone specifically to organisations fighting global poverty, which is what I'm talking about for this 5%. I'm not talking about giving it to the Opera House or something of that sort. Um, so uh, the table then increases. If you get into the top 10% of Australian earnings, you'll find it asks you to give more and so on. And of course, you can give more than that. But it's basically saying, how much ought you to give to feel that, well, OK, I'm doing something worthwhile. I'm doing my part. And that's the amount that I come up with. And I come up with those amounts because I look at, suppose that all of the affluent people in the world, all of the people who are middle class or above in the affluent nations, United States, Canada, Australia, affluent European nations, plus the few hundred million affluent Chinese and Indians and Brazilians, if they were all to put in, according to this scale that I've suggested, how much would be raised and what impact would that have on global poverty? And although, as I say, it's quite a small amount that I'm talking about, I'm not talking about huge amounts, it turns out that this is several times the world's foreign aid budget at the moment. And it's according to uh, Jeffrey Sachs, the uh, Columbia University economist who was worked for Kofi Annan, um, uh, at the United, United Nations uh, formulating the Millennium Development Goals. Um, according to his calculations, it's, it's also several times more than would be required to meet the Millennium Development Goals, which dramatically reduce, they don't eliminate, but they dramatically reduce the number of people in, global po in, in poverty, extreme poverty, the number of children dying in, uh, from poverty-related diseases, the number of people who can't afford to send their children to schools, and uh, so on. So that's why I'm encouraging people to set this as a realistic standard where you can feel that you're doing your part. And of course, if that's not enough, and perhaps for many of you it's not enough, you can give more or, also important, you can give your time. And you can work actively. We're forming groups now uh, where people can work with others to try to change the norms, to try to change the standards that people accept for what is it to live an, an ethical life if you're in a, fortunate enough to be in a country that is so affluent? And the idea, as I say, to promote the idea that it does require you to share some of your good fortune with others. Now, I know some people will say, well, um, is this really going to make a difference? People have all sorts of reasons and excuses, I think, for not giving. Some of them say, well, how do I know the money is really going to get to the people who need it? Um, and for that, I would recommend, as I say, you look at the material from Oxfam, you look at their websites, you look at uh, thelifeyoucansave.com, which also has a page describing some highly effective organizations and how to rate them. Um, and I think, although it may be true that not all organizations are highly effective, we can certainly find some that are. We are not talking about giving money to governments where it might disappear into the pockets of a corrupt dictator. That's not what foreign aid is about. We're talking about organizations with people in the field, working with local people in the field, with grassroots organizations, making sure that the aid gets where it's needed. Other people say, well, look, isn't the problem really that we just have too many people on this planet anyway? We passed 7 billion not that long ago. It's still rising. We can't cope with that. You talk about saving the lives of children, but if you save the lives of children, they'll grow up and have more children. It's really not going to help. That's a, a rather grim view of the world, of course, that you can't save a child's life because there'll be too many people on the planet. And I think it's a very selfish view when you look at how we live and how many resources we consume compared to the resources that the poor consume. Here's just one quick example relating to greenhouse gases, which of course one of the great limits on development is that people put out greenhouse gases and we know that's changing the climate of the planet. Well, if you look at 
equal shares of greenhouse gases. There's a German government advisory commission that tried to work out how much greenhouse gases the world could take without dramatic, disastrous climate change by 2050. And then allocated that to different nations on an equal per capita share. The same amount for every person in the world. Why does any person have a right to use more greenhouse gases than anyone else? And then worked out how, many greenhouse, how much greenhouse gases the nation is emitting currently, and therefore how soon it will run out of its per capita share. Well, Australia, at present rates of emission, will run out of its per capita share in about 10 years. So in about 10 years, we'll have used up all of our fair share between now and 2050. After that, we'll be pulling other people's shares. A really poor nation, I think at the bottom was the African nation of Burkina Faso, could continue to emit its present greenhouse gas emissions for the next 2,800 years before it used up its fair share up to 2050. So that ratio between 2,800 and 10, 280 to 1, is the ratio of how much more we're using as compared to what they're using. So I, that's why I think it's very selfish of us to suggest that um, there aren't enough resources in the world for us to share. Plus, and this is, I think, the really important point, it's only when we give people a certain basic security, and it's only when we make it possible for them to educate their children, particularly when we make it possible for them to educate their daughters, that we really will succeed in doing something about reducing population growth. Because I think the education of women is a key factor in giving them control over fertility and in reducing population growth. So the kind of thing that I'm talking about is part of that. Now, I only have two minutes left, so let me just say one thing to come back to this theme of happiness. I believe, as I said at the beginning, that setting yourself an ethical purpose like this will make you happier. But don't just take my word for it. There are plenty of surveys which show that when you ask people how much do they give to charity, or how much either money or time, how involved are they with charitable works, and then you also ask them how happy are they, how satisfied are they with their life, how well do they think things are going at the moment, you get a strong correlation between those who give more and uh, those who are happier. This may work in various ways, but um, neuroscience has just shown us one curious way in, that it, in which it actually works in the brain. Neuroscientists have put people in under scanners that are taking images of their brain and given them some money and said, now you can choose to do what you want with this money. You can choose to buy some things with it, or you can choose to give it to a charity of your choice. And no one else is going to know. We won't know what you did with it. So it's not that you're doing it in order to improve your reputation with us. And they found that those who chose to give it to charity had more activity in the centers of their brain that reward us the same parts of the brain that are active when we eat delicious food or when we have good sex or other activities that we really enjoy are triggered by giving. So we are wired to be compassionate. This brings me back perhaps to some of the themes of, that Rinpoche had. We are wired to be compassionate and to be rewarded by that. And in the right circumstances and the right conditions, not always admittedly, not when we're struggling for survival, but in the right circumstances and the right conditions, being kind, being generous, and living an ethical life, living a life where our practice is in harmony with our ethics and our values is a way of finding happiness for yourself too. Thank you very much. <laughs>